Yeah, welcome back everyone for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 1.1 where we try to put an emphasis a little bit on, you know, different practical aspects that you need in HPC and we will motivate why the title of the lecture today is C programming and scheduling throughout the lecture. So you will see that many of the applications in HPC are either C and even Fortran, so rather traditional programming languages uh, opposed to Java or C Sharp maybe. Of course, some people have now, of course, also C++. So there's programming languages that are a little bit more modern as C and Fortran, of course. But still think about that these codes we will discuss have been grown over long, you know, kind of time, often with scientific peer review, papers, engineering disciplines. So this is a really interesting topic. And today we will not have a complete C programming, let's say, introduction. It's really a short introduction. And also the amount of C programming you have to do in the course is rather moderate. It's not really to become here a C full programmer or full C developer. That's much more in other courses. But before we go into the material of actually this lecture, let us review what we learned in the last lecture, which was giving you a kind of high level introduction into high performance computing. Although in some pieces, we really go to some details, which were the HPC basics, um, where we really have to understand what is a processor, what is a memory, what is a layer cache strategy. And also we had some ecosystem technologies. So from the HPC basics, of course, you can think of the HPC architectures that we looked at, that there are key ingredients in all of this to enable high performance computing that is actually not that different from single thread <clears throat> and single, let's say, serious serial programming. So in a way, you really look at this like um, now we have different level programming although of course we use it in the normal programming languages. So this is, let's say, not different. However, when you think about one step ahead then, comparing serial programming to parallel programming, you always have these different processors that really have their life on their own. They have the different timeline. They do different things if you program it that way. And with this, you have quite some power. If you remember lecture one, we had the top 500, our system jewels, and others, let's say, was having 500,000 cores up to millions of cores in the top 500. So with this, you have challenges of really thinking about, firstly, how to really enable the programming here. So you're basically leaving the memory space, perhaps, of one processor and entering the one of another. So you need message exchanges. And this was one of the ideas how you program these, and this will come become more obvious in the next couple of lectures when we talk about the so-called message passing interface. What really is behind this, um, basically from the architecture point of view, is that you have a distributed memory architecture. So what does that mean? I mean, we have the multi-core processor that you all basically have in your laptops right now, and which we can consider maybe one of the smallest building blocks we have in the HPC machine today. You have one core, several other cores, all of them share the capability of being, let's say, high single thread performance. So they're quite good process, uh, processors. And all of them have this interesting layer caches, which are important for the data throughput, right? Which we also discuss every now and then in the course. So this is something which is just one chip. Now, when you think about that, this is just one chip, a HPC system, with lots of different parallel processes want to have many of those. So you can consider this P that you see here and the caches exactly like one of these building blocks you have here and that we introduced in the last lecture. So of course, with this comes this DRAM or DRAM or RAM memory, which you can consider as Z memory exclusively for this, let's say, specific processor. So whenever this processor wants to write in this memory, there's essentially no problem in this. Um, the difficulty starts now when you think about that a HPC machine, of course, needs lots of different of those multi-core processors. And we're talking about that we are having here five, of course, normally in a P HPC system, we have seen in lecture one, we have much, much more. So it's just an illustration helper here. 
but they have some form of a network interface to actually being able to communicate with the processor actually next door. This communication network is far away from those we know from the internet. So it's not really a secured communication. Here, so you don't want to have, let's say here, some form of a chat client or something um, that is maybe going there and, and you know bank transfers and stuff like this. Uh, if you want to route parallel um, from one user to another and things like this, so basically having this HTTPS space, don't think about this. Here we are much more low level. We have a communication network with a protocol and also an implementation. We have InfiniBand connections really having extremely high performance to connect to one and another processor. Now, when you consider now the idea of what you see essentially here, that you want to use these in parallel to solve a problem in a cooperative way, that was the idea of you know parallel computing, if you remember that we had in lecture one, then you would consider having message exchanges to say, well, this is my data right now, please work on this while I work on different things. And once you're ready, you maybe send it me back or you go you know, to different processes and every now and then you get some data back. So you need a parallel strategy, a really domain decomposition, a parallelization strategy, approach, things we will have in the next lectures. But the key message to take away really is that we already have introduced roughly the key message exchange paradigm we have in HPC systems today, which is really the MPI standard. However, we also learned that basically this is one thing. So across nodes, as we would call it, uh, what about shared memory? So of course, this paradigm is still there. If you think about that, we have these days uh, different processors on, on, let's say on one chip, then of course you can think about that shared memory processing also makes sense. So instead of processors, which are really different in the memory space, you have just different threads and these different threads will be then actually using shared memory. And with this shared memory, we can do a lot. And you can imagine that this is of course much more faster writing and reading to memory than we can do with this message exchanges. However, um, today, how the systems are used in the most performance is really to use OpenMP together with MPI jointly. So something we will come back to in, in later lectures. But the interesting thing is that there's NUMA and CC NUMA standing for, a, let's say, uniform memory access and a non-uniform memory access, which essentially means there's a specific link saying, indeed, it is remote memory, but you don't really feel it as developers. It's, it's, still a shared address space, so to speak, and the coherent link here makes sure that you really don't are exposed to this. The benefit is here, of course, also thinking about the different caches, cache meshes, but uh, all of these performance improvements we'll have also in later lectures. Now, this was a kind of multi-core only view, if you want. Uh, basically, of course, you know already that the ecosystem is expanding in HPC much larger, and this is uh, in many ways on, on, on different areas. And the one of the key areas we will have also a complete lecture about it in the course is a GPU, a graphical processing unit that actually has the origin in gaming. I think many of, new, uh, of you know the NVIDIA um, graphic cards, starting here maybe from Tesla in the past. Now we had basically over Kepler, then Pascal, Volta, and now really A100s. So it, it's getting very interesting with these processes because they their processing capability within the heart of those GPUs is actually rather limited. It is, let's say, moderate processors that are actually constitute to this many core instead of multi-core. So many stands here for much, much, much more cores that we have in the multi-core. Many cores stands for hundreds of cores. So, but all of those cores would be too hot to employ on such a machine if there would be high single thread performance, really good in performance. Hence, these are just moderate single thread performance CPUs. So they basically the heat, the clock frequency of these professor, uh, processors is rather limited, but you have lots of them which you can use in parallel. We also learned that essentially the drawback of GPUs today, if you will, is, is essentially the, the bypass of going from a host CPU, as we call it, via the main memory to device memory and then to the GPU. In other words, the GPU really needs a host CPU 
to work. So there have been uh, basically different approaches from Intel, from other vendors in the past to bypass this problem. And I think many people work on these problems these days, but still it's essentially the only way how to get something into memory. There are also constructs with the GPU direct interfaces and there are aspects like NVLink and NV switch to couple more GPUs if you maybe want to transfer also data and so on. Uh, but the problem and key problem that remains is you can have this rather on islands. So these NV links and NV switches are rather limited in the amount of GPUs you can connect. And now when we talk about hundreds of hundreds of GPUs, as you have seen in Jewels, then we need much different paradigms to really interconnect much more GPUs. However, we will have a complete lecture about it. Just a key message to take away again, I think, is that actually the GPUs and the moderate processors are just beautifully used if you think about that many of the operations we do in many applications are mathematical. And you have here one example of a very famous one, which is, you know, uh, matrix vector multiplication. And you already see with the color encoding, if you remember a little bit how the mathematical uh, principles are to compute this, this is independent. So independent stands for I can chop it up as you see in the color coding and give it to one processor and the other processor is then using the other color code and the other processor is using the other color code. And in the end, you don't need to know from the other processors anything, only that you write at some point in time, of course, here in this um, vector A, uh, then the basically the, the results. And this is a very highly interesting aspect of this GPUs. We will come back to when we have the GPU lecture, this independent processing. Um, in previous times, people have said embarrassingly parallel, uh, basically nicely parallel, and really is a complete difference than massively parallel. We will learn in the course uh, basically very much about the difference because you have seen that in this nicely parallel and embarrassingly parallel or independent here, uh, computing plays a big role, for instance, if you think about deep learning algorithms. So we will have a lecture about this explaining why the GPUs are really very powerful. But there are also other lectures like in the terrestrial domain uh, or here in earthquakes where massively parallel, where really every tile next door of the domain decomposition of the earth is affecting and influencing the status of the tile directly now at the time step uh, on, on the neighbors. And with this neighboring effect, you always basically need lots of lots of communication. And this communication between these, let's say, different processes or threats is then what it makes it massively parallel. So lots of these interactions are needed. While here in the deep learning, we will learn also in one of the, let's say, application lectures, this is rather independent from each other. But so much really for the last lecture that we had in lecture one, really kickstarting the course with lots of interesting technology, of course, on a more or less sometimes 10,000 feet perspective, like here the GPUs or also the multi-cores and what we can do with MPI. But of course, the idea is now that in the subsequent lectures, you will learn much more about it. So the idea of this lecture today is then rather thinking about, okay, we have this different technology aspects, which are a little bit conceptual, if you want, and a bit more theoretical. What is now the practical parts of the HPC? And we start this a little bit today by thinking about applications, which we usually face on the high performance computing system. So the outline, therefore, is to think really about C programs. So we will motivate this. Why in Earth we want to now start with C programming, right? This is one of the frequently asked questions by students, of course, from the past that think about, well, we have Java right now, we have C Sharp right now. So why is there C programming in scientific and engineering computing? <clears throat> this has something to do with performance. It has something to do that these codes that we do follow specific physical um, laws uh, and actually numerical methods every now and then that basically have been stand the test of time that have been actually created over peer review in science or are basically really um, established in disciplines of engineering. So in the end, you have something which is growing over decades, possibly partly. That's why even Fortran actually is still in scientific computing used. For instance, in the weather forecast, you see that VARF, weather research and forecast, 
is basically one of the codes that is still in Fortran. And we will come back to this when we talk about the real applications. Now, when we go to the other part that we want to really have here as a practical lecture, I will show you a little bit how programming a very simple C program looks like. And of course, we do this with having in mind already our first practical lecture. So we will go to real HPC system to our U-turn environment. We will also understand a little bit this is practical better, practical um, lecture better. What is a module environment? So why I need a C compiler? What has this to do with GNU? And actually all of these role of compiling a program in C, because many of you that had been maybe Java in the past don't have that problem. So essentially in Java, you have an interpreter, uh, you have a complete different approach to this. So I will demonstrate this a little bit. Still the slides capture all the essence that you have on the practical lectures, but we're also recording. So this really is something what you need essentially as a very basic skill set and that you learn here as a basic skill set in order to actually do the assignments. However, the assignments are not with the idea of making it extremely hard in C programming. I know frequently asked questions about this. So how much C programming is there? How much complexity is there? This course is about parallel computing. So we want to understand parallelization. We want to have domain decomposition. Our goal is not to have the perfect C program. This is something what you learn in software engineering. That is what basically learn in software development. That's not our goal here. Our goal is different. In this course, we will have rather simple programs every now and then, but simple in the world of C programming with different functions and different classes in C++. So this will be, let's say, rather very simple. The more complexity relies then in the parallel programming. Hence, here this is really a, a big difference from this, where you also have to think about that we don't want to use just C as a programming language with some libraries. We basically do this on a remote fashion in a C SSH environment on the HPC system, uh, reusing one or two of these modules we know. And you will see then this is, of course, something that you have to really um, actually understand. And it's quite different from doing it, for instance, on your local laptop, on Eclipse, for instance. So in this, we also learn, of course, how to execute C programs. And there's a common um, problem in this, which always new users will run into. That's why it's a very emphasized here in this lecture in the first part. And then we will show it how not to do it. And in the second part of this lecture, I show you how to do it. And this would be quite interesting. In general, the, the capture, I mean, the, the essence of this lecture today is really not just doing C programs. You can actually, when you do this assignments, you will realize if you basically then look up the web, you will see examples of MPI code using collective operations. Doesn't mean anything to you. We will see how that materialize in the next couple of courses or course hours and lectures. But this means the, the, the C aspect is, of course, something where you can lock up a lot of things. However, when you come to HPC system, things are different. It's not your only C program environment. You have a multi-user system. That means many people will compile C programs and will want to execute them. So we will talk a little bit more about the scheduler that is there on almost every HPC system that is around the world. And we will understand what this means. What are scheduling principles like first come, first served? Or basically also we'll go more into details what the slurm examples are that we have also in our HP system in Newton. Finally, at the end of the second part, then we will see how to really execute then C programs using this scheduler. And this is a preferred use of using a HPC system. You can always do something on the so-called login node, and I will explain what the login node is in this course. But the idea, of course, of using HPC system is to not really use a login node much. You have to use a compute nodes, the big nodes, the, the ones that have really lots of lots of professors, uh, processors and lots of lots of basically power behind it. So pass your seatbelt for a practical lecture. And we start a little bit with rethinking the learning outcomes in this context. Of course, this has something to do with using and, you know, the high performance clusters that we have in high performance computing today. And also about really these environment tools that support the programming. Think about that there's C. Okay. So how we load C? We need a module environment. Maybe that loads C 
if you have a dependency of a certain implementation uh, or basically certain programming, we want to prepare for MPI. So that means we need perhaps another specific compiler in the future that will understand MPI. So we prepare already for this. And this brings you a little bit to this HPC environment tools. Of course, this lecture today could be done with a typical C compiler. There's no point of using necessarily OpenMPI, uh, which is an implementation of MPI. But of course, I also want to teach you those things which you really can directly apply in the assignments. So it's really, let's say, focused for our purpose in the course. So let's start with the first part, the programming and compiling C programs. And in a way, I know from the past that people were really uh, asking questions. So this time is over. Like C has been in the past, Java is today the modus operandi, or you have even other languages which are supported in different, uh, basically, programming environments. One example might be Scala. If you are in, let's say, Apache Spark and a machine learning developer, you would maybe want to implement some things in Spark. Some use Ruby for quite advanced stuff, uh, you will see a plethora of programming languages. But what's really used in HPC applications mostly is, of course, in the data intensive sciences, more and more Python. And of course, this has entered HPC as well. So you will see that more and more codes here and there use Python in some way. But when you really go to some of the really large codes, which have been, let's say, developed in the last 10, maybe even longer periods, you will see that mostly is written in C. And I don't give you a lot of examples here. I think we will come back to this when we have our lecture 10 up to 15, when we go really do it through the application areas of HPC. But here I picked two different cases to really motivate you why C programming is important if you enter in scientific computing, if you enter in you know, engineering computing. Here you have terrestrial systems, as the one example that I also showed you already before a little bit. So if you think about that, these are kind of three different codes, as we told basically already in previous lectures. So you would have the idea of one to really have the water modeling completely understood. You cannot just use a subsurface here with Parflow, which is a specific course, a specific code really modeling this. You also have to take into account the land surface. So what's happening there in terms of water? So you would have the CLM code actually working on this level. And you see already they have different domain decompositions, meaning they're chopped up differently. Things we will learn in lecture three then much more precisely. However, if you think about water, you also have to think about the atmosphere. So there's also Cosmo as another code. And so you have three different codes which are all written in C that are executed in parallel on the same HPC machine. So you can imagine that this is already quite some complexity. And of course, think about that they have chemical variables, physical variables that they need to exchange. So in the end, we need something called a coupler that we will see actually much more deeply when we go into the terrestrial systems lecture at the end of the course, because it's a very advanced way of using a HPC system if you really couple different codes together. However, you can imagine this also has some realistic part in it, if you can, you know, refine your codes toward this and really optimize toward this. However, for this lecture today, just I want to motivate you that this is a cutting edge code in the terrestrial systems area, and it's primarily written in C. Now, the other hand, um, when you go to maybe more medical sciences and neuroscience, you will find the so-called nest simulator. This is like basically trying to have a model of the human brain. So that means really how we think and how we spike and how we create new connections in the brain and really focusing on a lot of different aspects. Um, and it's of course a very interesting research area. And also there we have a neuroscience lecture where we'll uh, then of course present you much more details on this nest code, but also of course then data science methods for it. But here also the key message to take away for this particular lecture today is it is a highly optimized simulation kernel uh, actually going after very nice uh, disciplines in software engineering. So they have an interesting uh, Git approach and a really a very good uh, repository and it's written in C++. So another motivation for C programming, uh, C++ is just an object oriented extension to C. 
and is used more and more also in the scientific programming environments. Now, this is basically a kind of motivation for you. Admittedly, you would say it's just two applications, but really, trust me, if you go through all the different applications, you will see even more C programs. And as I told you already, if you maybe move through all the different areas that we have in scientific computing that we have in HPC, you will see even there are some or quite some Fortran actually codes also existing. But more about these applications basically then in the future. Again, for those that listening, um, the most important thing is here not to be a perfect C developer in the course. So don't be scared about this and then quit the course now. So the idea of the C programming is to keep it moderate. However, we will experiment much more how you basically can put the C code on different cores to execute it in parallel. That is something I will not really show today because we have our MPI lecture just coming up. And once we have done this, then we can talk a little bit about, you know, doing really parallel computing. In the moment, it's still a little bit basics where we introduce a little bit of C and, you know, an idea of using a compiler because not everybody in the course is actually uh, an active user of compiling because these days are script languages. There's Java with an interpreter. So we want to get, let's say, the majority of the course really on one page here. That's why we introduce a little bit of C programming. So you will see that this is actually also not that complicated if you want, right? This is uh, relatively straightforward, particularly because we will have mostly relatively moderate C codes, which are not really uh, cutting edge, ma ma very massive classes. And if we use them like in one of the clustering codes, maybe we're just using it and we're not programming it to much rather understand the parallel nature when doing things. So the modus operandi, how you would do your assignment in a sense will be starting like this. So in the end, we have the next couple of steps, which will be very close to what you have to do to compile a C program on this HPC machine. And you can imagine the first step we really have to do that I will demonstrate now is really going with HPC, to the HPC system again with SSH. Things you have already learned in one of the first practical lectures. So there's no surprise in this. Um, we use here the mobile X term SSH client now as a kind of, you know, um, just a demonstrator. But, you know, basically those that have already a Linux derivative or those on the Mac, you can just use a command line that I essentially also use here directly. Um, this is not a problem. You can use putty in Windows if you like. My recommendation is, however, use a free version of mobile X term. It has quite some benefit. You can copy paste into it. I think putty doesn't allow it. And in generally, it has some other features like X11 forwarding if you want to have some graphics, remote displays. However, one key thing when we now think about Uton was there and we set its username password. So there's not an SSH key, which is, makes it a little bit more vulnerable to really systematic attacks. So on the other end, this means we have to protect it in a way so you don't have it directly accessible if you're not in the VPN or in the university network. Hence, we learned the last time in the one of the practical lectures that really we need to make a hop first to the Heckler system. And then from Heckler, we have to go to YouTube. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate, you know, in a practical fashion right now. <clears throat> you see here the mobile X term environment. Um, you essentially have here Heckler. I don't really repeat now how to create an SSH section. I think this is what you already know. So here you see I pick the heckler.rhoe.howe.is with my Morris identity. And then basically I'm on this heckler system. And now we said this is now basically the one where we don't want to be, right? You remember one of the commands we said, it's host name minus i. So I'm really on heckler, but this is just one step. So I did the first step right, but I really want to be on your turn. With the up arrow, you can actually get into the history, what happened before. And with the down arrow, you can navigate through commands you executed before. Another interesting practical tip for those that are not really into Unix very much. So when you do now this, this next hop, you can use just a command line of saying ssh morris at uton.rae.howe.is. And of course, here you see now we usually have to provide our password. And of course, this is the one that you have been given. And 
we see the welcome screen of UTUN here that there's nothing very specific to report. You know already the website of HTTP ehpc.is and of course there's some quota aspects and so forth. So um, an interesting thing is now to, to think about what we can do then now with C. So we are logged in. We have here, let's say, lots of um, files. Or for some of you that for the first time use YouTube, you have basically almost nothing. You see just, let's say, a couple of these um, maybe from, you know, being pre-installed. But you don't have the HPC course history and so on. So don't worry. That's clear that you don't have that. It's not the idea of the course just to basically have another frequently asked question. So we will have, of course, a development now of all the codes that you see in these directories. So let's continue a little bit with the slides. We are successfully entered the Buton system, so that's where we are. The so next step usually is then to create your C program. And this is something what you do in a typical text editor. Hence, you remember maybe um, that we had this VI editor that we found quite, um, let's say, robust and maybe a little bit not so user friendly. So hence, you don't have to use VI. I will demonstrate it on VI. But again, a frequently asked questions to this is, um, do I have to really use a VI? No, you can use whatever is on the systems. Um, some students prefer Nano, for instance. Others have even uh, taken the way of getting to Emacs or no Emacs from the past. So they're different editors, but usually um, the way is is kind of uh, like this, that you have to have this editor. Just from experience from previous courses, I also want to outline, of course, you can use the following feature. You will see that Mobile X term, for instance, or maybe also others have this idea or other SSH clients have also here a graphical part. You can, of course, do it locally on your system if you like. If you have a Linux, you can use, for instance, it using it and then upload your code. You know, then basically the benefit would be uh, that you maybe have an Eclipse installation locally with the C or you have some, uh, some C environment um, that you want to use with you know, kind of uh, code highlighting and code completion and different aspects of a, let's say, integrated development environment, as it is usually called an IDE. Um, in this sense, I'm quite open minded to all of this in the assignments. So the way I'm demonstrating it is surely, let's say, the one that is, you know, really available to everyone. But if you want to have your different aspects, please do so. So what we're going to do is create a hello C file, um, basically with a Hello World program, you see it doesn't do much. It includes standard input and output, a header file in C, where you'd always do this to build and get in libraries. And you need a main, basically, file that you have or the main function that you have really in a C program. And usually the return code of the program gives a little bit an indicator if it was an error or not. It's so-called exit codes. And the only really essence of this C program will be the printf function. So when you execute this as a program, automatically the main function will be called and all it was it does should be hello world. So of course this is, let's say, not the most fancy program. So when we look at this now at the demo, we can see that um, I already a little bit prepared this here not to you know, take this as a too much endeavor. We will go our course and if you do this, I would recommend that you do a directory like 2021 HPC course. And if you do so, my another require, uh, basically not really requirement, but recommendation is that you create maybe an MPI and open MP uh, directory for different parts of the course. And when you then go into the MPI, you can then create maybe for the different assignments, for the practical lectures that you want to just redo, maybe to learn better, to really do the hello, you know, or basically we'll see soon MPI collectives. You create a little bit structure in, in, in directories and you know always how that works. If mkdir new dir, you create a new directory, it's existing. And if you want to remove it and you're not happy with it, you can always remove it with, you know, rm minus rf. So it's quite flexible, right? You cannot do anything wrong, but it helps you to keep a little bit structure. So, because in the end of the course, you will see we have quite some C codes in different versions. And so it's really good to, to get this like uh, basically in a more structured fashion. 
So here you see also um, the idea that we had on the slide. So we include the standard library for input output. We have the main function that is always called. We say the exit code, if it, you know, the program will execute until this way, then we really can give a zero back, which means it was completely and good executed. You see also we have a print f hello world. So this is what we expect should be popping out of this program if we actually execute it. Now we are on a HPC system. Again, host main minus A says we are really essentially on the UTIN system. Now what's what's up with this UTIN system? What's different when we now think about this? The one difference is we already learned there's a module environment. So we have to learn certain modules to be loaded. And one of those is for instance here, um, the installed compilers. Here's an example of the MPI CC that we're gonna use and use it with a C program that you have as a text file and then the minus O gives you an indicator where the compiled executable. And this ping pong here is something you can really execute. And to load this, you really have some kind of dependency, which I will just allude to a little bit. We want to use OpenMPI already. Um, and this is basically also what we can use to compile then. Essentially C programs, we don't have to do this because there are other C compilers. But of course, we are in the end interested in using this with our C MPI programs. We will come to next week. So hence, we prepare this a little bit for you. And uh, this is the module environment that basically we want to look at and we want to use. I give a small demonstration and then explain a little bit. When we have here module avail, for instance, we will see the modules which are available in UTUN. There are quite some of them. I don't want to discuss all of them. There's the HP DB scan that we will go to. It's a parallel and scalable DB scan clustering algorithm. If you do machine learning and data mining, this is quite handy. It's parallel, it's optimized for HPC, and of course, also a C code. However, that's not what we use today. It will be one of lecture 10 aspects, or really in the future uh, of this course. But of course, you see already that this has quite some standard of the course. The same is true for the MPI implementation. You see here different versions uh, of what you can use when you do this module avail. Hence, what we usually do is then uh, we can inform ourselves and say module spider and then open MPI. And this gives us a little bit more details about this. And there's interesting description about it, which is of course important. It's a powerful implementation of MPI. Oh, that sounds great. So we're going to use that. But it also is, you know, this, this comes with some preconditions. So you see this module can only be loaded through the following modules. So we need GNU before. And so this means in order to load this, what we learned already theoretical, um, we basically have to, before we load this open MPI, we have to load GNU, right? Because it's a kind of recommendation to do so. So we will load module load GNU, and then we can directly in the same command say open MPI. And with this, that's not a problem at all. It works. And now our whole, let's say, library is loaded and we can use it. And I will demonstrate it, of course, when we compile the C program. So in order to compile the C program, we have the hello C program just looked at. We have to use a compiler. And by doing so, we basically have a specific command that is executing this compiler in this fashion I already was explaining with ping pong. So you have MPICC, basically using your C code, whatever it is, here in our case it's hello.c, and you have to specify, or I recommend to specify the output file, right? And the output file is an executable that you always see in your turn with an interesting color coding, but you also can realize it by this X sign here. So this is really something you can execute. So this is a executable then we basically can really use to have our hello world print out. So let's do this a little bit. There's no magic behind it. Um, you can also use, you know, the arrow up once you do this and then change it. One example is that I gave you here that I have done this in the past. So I just do the arrow up again, go through the history of commands and see luckily I have my MPI CC here. So of course this only works where you have your C code running, right? Or where you basically have your C code available in our hello directory. Hence, what we see is it compiles brilliantly. 
and we are right now in this interesting directory. PWD means print working directory, and we see essentially here the MPI hello um, directory, and I want to see what's in the directory. I do ls minus l and see actually there's a hello executable. So submit hello we will deal with in the second part of this lecture because this is related to scheduling. But you see also that hello is now executable. So what you can do essentially to just execute it for some that know already the Unix environment is essentially do something like this for an example. And what we expect is that there would be hello world written. And it is. So this is a perfectly simple C program, perfectly executed, but we are on the login node. So what is a login node? And basically this would be the last part of this first part of the lecture. The, the problem or basically what we should not do usually is to execute things on the login node. Um, you can imagine that for a hello world, this might be not a big issue if we all in the course do that. But if we would say have all the nest code or this, let's say terrestrial system code with three different MPIs, Firstly, it would be, you know, very hard to, to reach the other cores, but also the load of the login node will be so increased that it maybe breaks down, it is too slow. So usually what we do is we use a UTIN login node with SSH. And what we didn't here is not the preferred way to go. It was just my demonstration here, right? If you want to have a 24 climate simulation or your assignments, please go to the scheduler. And that's why the second part of this lecture is about the scheduler. Hence, take away the message. What I demonstrated right now was more a demo for you to understand how C works and the executable. And in the end, that all is normal C. There's no parallel part in it yet. The first thing we start with the next part of this lecture after break will be then thinking about what is a scheduler, why it helps, and why it's actually the preferred way of executing jobs. If you keep executing on the login node, these gentlemen here um, basically will then uh, give you at some point in time some message that you actually do it the wrong way. And in the real production environments, people that overdoing using the login node or so actually can also be thrown out of the system. So take this seriously, especially when you move out of this course into production environments. The login node is a no go for really large executions. And I leave that on the table for you right now. Uh, we will come back a little bit to this then in the preferred way with an overview in the second part of this lecture.